All right. Thanks, Benji. I know you made all that music, so I'm grooving to it in the background there. Ah, it's good to be here. It's sort of, uh, I wish I could see everybody in person, but, uh, you know, that's where we are. It's sort of the inner product uh, time here, so I'm going to jump in here because uh, Noel just went, so I was happy to have him start off, and I'll see what I can do going forward. So today, um, or tonight, uh, I'm going to talk about this big subject. It has this long title, Concurrent State Machines with Cat's Effect. And uh, just before we start, I just wanted to point out that uh, uh, Noel and I are inner product. We're a consulting firm. We'll help you with your projects. We have expertise in Scala, functional programming. We'll help train and mentor your staff. So that's kind of what we do. All right, enough of that. Let's get into the nitty gritty. So keyboard work. There we go. All right, so first, we're going to talk about state machines and concurrency. So I don't want anybody to panic, especially me. You know, this is hard stuff. Um, so I got this nice, uh, I found this cool uh, Twitter vaguely trained machine. And isn't that nice? Like, uh, that's not, our code isn't like that, you know, but, you know, we can, maybe this is an ideal we can work towards. So I'm going to try and give you some, some, some breaks during like this heavy technical stuff and say, oh, Ah, you know, this is nice. And by a weird coincidence, uh, I found this state machine. And you'll notice that little uh, mushroom there. I actually found one of these, a whole bunch of these mushrooms here in Seattle um, just the other day, like two days ago. And uh, But don't eat them. They're, they're, they're very bad for you. You'll get really high, and then you'll die. So don't do that. OK, that's my little preamble. So we're going to talk about concurrency to start out with. A big subject, um, and so to kind of start our story, we we can imagine we just have these components, you know, these cubes. There's there's x and there's y, and they each have their own behavior. They do stuff, but um, you know, x does its stuff and y does its stuff, and we run them in parallel. We say, you know, go. Um, what do we know about these things? We, we know that X is going to do stuff, and we know that Y is going to do other stuff. But do they talk to each other? Do they interact? How do they run? Um, and this is kind of like getting to the idea of how do we define concurrency so we can talk about it and reason about it, hopefully. Um, and in particular, can we say, if we sort of launch these at the same time, um, you know, I'm using cat's effects syntax that I'll get into. Can we say which one happens first? Um, and so you can think to yourself, well, it's either yes or no, or maybe I don't know. Um, so make a guess. And so they, we don't really know because they're running concurrently. And that's actually what concurrency means. We can, we say that these two things are concurrent because we can't tell by looking at the program, which will happen first. So we're going to use that, uh, that definition for what concurrency means. And there's a whole bunch of consequences that you probably know about uh, that I'm going to go into. Like, well, OK, fine. We, we can't tell which is going to happen first, but is that important? When is it important or when is it not important? And th th that, that definition is from this great little book. Um, it's called The Little Book of Semaphores. Um, I, think I have a link to it at the end. Um, so it's a, it's a bit, con it could be a confusing definition. It, we, it's concurrent if we can't tell which will happen first. Um, so it's sort of like a negative definition. Um, so if you want to think about it the other way, if you know which will happen first, then that means you know the sequence of events. I know that A happens before B or X does something and then Y does something. And that means things are sequential. It has nothing to do with threads or you know something like that. They could run on different threads. This is when did they happen globally. Um, so that's sort of a, a different way. So if they're not sequential, if we can't tell the order, they are concurrent. OK. So now, if we have these things that are concurrently running, that means we don't really, you can't tell anything about them. But maybe they need to coordinate. They need to, to collaborate to do their job. Um, so invoking the spirit of Rich Hickey, we can sort of say, well, what does coordination mean? Well, coordinate, that means we order together. 
So the order of events um, is determined by more than one thing going on at the same time. So how do we do this? How do we say in our code, you know, what techniques can we use to coordinate their behavior? We know how to just let them fly, but they, they may need to do something. Um, so probably the most common example, or at least a very common example, is we can coordinate between two, um, two entities with something like a queue, and it acts as like this mediator. So we have producers that are uh, trying to give things away, and there's consumers, which you know are, are wanting to take some of these things, and we can we can um, decouple our producers and consumers with a queue. And so it's really a it's it's not just a channel in which information flows, but it has um, some semantics to it. So so normally the producer just put, produces things, and the consumer takes them out of there. But what if uh, you know it's let's assume it's a finite queue. So if the queue is full, we want the queue to sort of say, whoa, I'm full. Come back later, producer. So that's some um, coordinating behavior. We don't want to be able, we don't want to push more than, than that bound that the queue is producing, uh, that, that queue is managing, which effectively protects the consumer. Uh, we don't want to overwhelm the consumer. And then on the other side, if, if there's nothing in the queue, when the con con consumer asks for something, and there's nothing there, well, we'll just have them wait until something arrives. And so in this sense, the queue is like mediating the experience between the producer and the consumer. And it has sort of different cases. Normal, there's a normal case, and then there's sort of these extreme cases where the queue is full or empty. So that kind of gives you, might give you a flavor of what coordination is about. There's these independent, um, Entities, producer, consumer, they're sort of mediated by something which controls their interaction. And there's lots and lots of these things. So we have a queue, we have like circuit breakers, it's sort of mediating between clients and servers. Um, and so like if the server is down, we want to say, well, if, a, if another, if we know the server is down, then we don't want to keep on failing and failing and failing. We'll just immediately, not, we'll not even try. Uh, from the client's perspective, and we'll just like wait for a little while, and we'll only try later. That's like what a circuit breaker does. Or a lock. There's all these things that are trying to uh, race for this exclusive access. Or there's a latch, or there's a barrier. There's sort of all these sort of um, things which help coordinate between multiple um, entities. And they're sort of encapsulated in these things. So what this talk is about, sort of given that background about what is concurrency, what are some examples of it, um, we want to be able to build these mediating components. So, so this talk is really how to build this coordinating component. And the technique that we're going to use is called a concurrent state machine. And we're going to do it on top of Cat's Effect, which is a library uh, by the type level folks built on Scala. Yay! And it's great. Um, so it's going to be in three parts. We're going to just talk a little bit more about the conceptual background. We're going to talk specifically about synchronization. So this is sort of a specialization of, uh, of coordination. Uh, then we're going to talk about some more practical things. Well, how do we, how do we do, what are, the, what are the primitives of synchronization using Cat's effect? And sort of see what these APIs are like, what the effects are. And then we'll get to, you know, with, the, with that background, and with the practical stuff, we'll be able to implement the big idea. We'll combine them together and we'll create this, we'll use this technique of the concurrent state machine to implement these concurrency components. Yes. Um, so I want to give a big shout out. Do, 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 do. That was a lousy horn, but um, to Fabio, who uh, I learned this from. He's taught many people. Uh, maybe it's an older idea, but he really explained it and implemented it in Cat's Effect uh, with the rest of the folks who work on Cat's Effect. So I uh, really appreciate that. And he's, you know, he's always online, online answering questions. Okay, there we go. So, so we're going to talk about synchronization. Here's a little, here's a little uh, state machine break. Uh, this one's kind of cute. It's like some creatures. There's a horse and a monkey and a little, a little baby bird 
Don't you want a little baby bird in your state machine? I do. That would be so much better. Okay. So synchronization, that's like, I don't have a watch, but you know, synchronize your watches is what they say. So what is this about? Well, here's the definition. And it says computer programmers are often concerned. We are often concerned, yes. With synchronization constraints, which are requirements pertaining to the order of events. Yes, we are very worried about the order of events. We're worried about the order of events happening on all these CPUs, the order of events coming and going from our message buses and Kafka thingamajigs and all this stuff. Very important. Everyone agrees. Um, so this is specifically about coordinating with respect to time, the order of events. Events happen in time. You put something in your cart, you check out your cart, and so on. Um, so some examples, you know, you could think about these as like your product requirements or your technical um, requirements. You know, we say things like do X, then do Y, then do Z. You know, time is involved. Or, you know, there's a precondition. You have to be logged in before you can do something else. Or like our queue example, when the buffer is full, you know, in time, you know, reject new requests. So we do this all the time. So you'll, you'll, now that this is on your mind, you'll start to see this, okay, this is about the order of events. So if we want to coordinate with the order of events, that requires synchronization. So there's various flavors of synchronization. Okay, how can we order events? How, how do we want them to be ordered? What conditions must be true? Um, so I'm going to talk about two. The first one is mutual exclusivity. So two events are mutually exclusive if they can't happen at the same time, only one at a time. You know, you, you might be familiar with this as like a mutex, that's where the word mutex comes from, mutual exclusion. Uh, and it's shorthand for something like a, a lock, for example, you might implement mutual exclusion with a lock or a monitor or something. And the other kind of synchronization we're gonna talk about is serialization. So it's not like, JSON serialization. This is more in terms of um, an ordering, serialized versus concurrent. So events or effects can be serialized if one must happen before the other. We do not want this to happen after or even at the same time. Something must happen before the other ones. So you can imagine uh, some use cases around these. I don't want something to happen at the same time. Why? I don't know. We'll figure it out. And I want this thing to happen before the other thing, or I want this thing to always happen before or after. So these are the ideas we're gonna play with. So mutual exclusion, uh, why, why do we need this? Well, um, there's a problem. So like if we had this, uh, you know, sort of a thread of a logical thread of execution and we had this variable X, we might wanna increment it. The problem with incrementing is it's actually two operations. We have to read the current value, that's like this uh, x, and then the actual assignment you know, of the equal here, um, the, the read and then the write. So we need to read and then write. The problem is somebody else can do a read and a write faster than us. So we might read the value in thread one, we'll see that x is zero, and uh, but somebody else reads it and uh, Re reads the same thing, zero, because this one hasn't incremented it yet. This is a classic example. Uh, and we lose our update. Boom. So we only want this increment, this update, to happen. We only want one to happen at the same time. We don't want this reader and writer to go on uh, you know, separately. We want to sort of atomically group updates so that they can only happen one at a time. Uh, so. How do we, how is it implemented? Well, in the JVM, we have the synchronized keyword that sort of says only, uh, you know, one thing can go into this critical section or there's volatiles, there's the atomic reference. Uh, and we're gonna see in cat's effect how we're gonna do it. So those are some of the mechanisms by which we can have mutual exclusion. And similarly, serialization says, okay, this must happen before something else. Um, so it's a little bit small, but we have like the 
the X thing doing whatever X is doing, and we want to ensure that Y does it after X. But if X doesn't control Y, how does Y know when to start? If X can't start Y, then, then X has to tell Y it's okay to start now. That's like the only way that Y can know, okay, now I should go. So these are bits, uh, so this is all like, okay, here's your vocabulary. It's not gonna be on the test. Um, but we need these terms to sort of say, these are the properties we want. So we wanna talk about ordering events. We wanna say, okay, these, these type of events like updates can't happen at the same time because we might lose, we might lose the uh, updates. Or events have to happen one after the other. So we don't want to be able to, we only wanna put an element in the queue uh, once we've determined that there's space, something, you know, some sort of ordering like that. So that's our background. So we have this new concept of synchronization and we have the sort of two tools. We have the mutual exclusion uh, idea and the, synchron the serialization idea. All right, on to the practical stuff. So now that we know about synchronization, how do we put this into practice with cat's effect? So here's our, you know, effects. They're spooky. It was Halloween. Uh, spooky effects. My book has a little cauldron on it. There we go. Ooh. I don't want to implement this state machine. It's very scary. So for those who may not be uh, familiar, cat's effect is a super library from type level. And it's a high performance asynchronous composable framework for building all sorts of good stuff. Uh, it is a grab bag of functional programming, especially focused on effects. So when I say the word effect in this sense, um, we can contrast it with a side effect. Um, as Rob Norris said, uh, effects are good and side effects are bugs. I think that's what Rob said. Um, so they're way, a way of writing referentially transparent um, actions that you can compose together in a safe way. That's good. We don't want side effects. We want to be able to understand our code. So inside of Cat's Effect, there are some facilities to perform the synchronization activities that we talked about. So again, there's mutual exclusion. There's this thing called a ref that we can use. Um, so this is... Um, it's like an atomic reference, but uh, wrapped up in the nice effectful interface. So that's sort of what that F is. It's like, it can, F could be like IO from cat's effect. So it says, I can uh, manage this value of type A and safely update it and not, uh, you know, in a mutually exclusive way and not have this lost update problem. And the other thing we can do with serialization, cat's effect provides a data type called deferred. So this is a, basically it's like a slot that says, okay, eventually it's like a promise. That's what it is. It's a promise. It says, I'm going to um, eventually have a value of type A. Uh, and if I don't have that value of type A, you can sort of wait as, as sort of who's, who wants it. You can get blocked and sort of say, okay, well, you tell me when it's available. This is like a signaling mechanism. And when somebody else says, here's the A to the deferred, the deferred will then unblock uh, everybody who's waiting. So there we have mutual exclusion of our updates using the ref, and the ref manages the state. And we can ensure that something happened by sort of this A value in the deferred is the event that says something happened, and here it is. Uh, so we get blocked, and we'll then can do something else once that value of type A appears. So going into the API a little bit, um, here's some code. You know, the classic example of, a, of using a, of some sort of you know, reference is like a counter. Um, so we're just gonna initialize it to zero. We're creating it. And then we're gonna like launch a bunch of workers in parallel, which we're gonna increment it. And then at the same time, we're gonna print that counter every five seconds. So we're gonna do like uh, concurrent writes and a concurrent read, all, all using the same value of this counter. So here's our worker on the left, and it's just going to recursively call itself. 
and all it's going to do is update it, I'll update the counter. So you get you can provide a little function, and that um, gets run in a mutually exclusive way inside of the reference. And then at the same time, there's one of these print counters running, and it's going to call it it's going to recall itself every five seconds, and it's going to get the value from the counter and print it, and it does the normal thing. So nothing nothing scary or fancy there. So sort of, if you want to get a view of the whole API, um, there's sort of, you can read the state, you get an effect back that holds it, you can set it, you can get it and set it, there's different update methods, and there's sort of a more flexible modification. Um, and notice they all return effects. So these operations are not happening now, they're happening when the effects are evaluated. And that's the sort of the basic principle that's, going, that's being used. So switching from mutual exclusion with ref to serialization of with deferred, um, deferred is 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 you know even simpler. It's just like this promise. It's a box that's going to hold a value of type A, and so you can wait for that. Um, you know, I want to get that value, and if it doesn't, if it's not there yet, well then the caller gets blocked, and if somebody has it who wants to signal somebody who's waiting. They can complete it with that value, and it just you know returns immediately. So it's just sort of this handoff. I'm waiting for an A. Here's the A. Somebody else says. So these are our primitives. So we can put them together. We have these two primitives. We have a ref that holds values that we can safely update, and we have the deferred, which sort of carries a signal between things. Somebody's providing a value and somebody is uh, waiting for it. Uh, and that's just what I said. And there we go. And I do want to sort of re-emphasize that um, because cat's effect is based on, is using effects, these referentially transparent things, they're safe. They're not side effects. Because they're safe, we can compose them. So you you know, if there if there are side effects, side effects are sort of by definition something that happens that you can't see. You don't you can't see from the code in front of you that it's going to happen. If it's safe, we can compose our operations together. We can do this and that and this and that, and we know that no, there's going to be no funny business. The, the guarantees of each call are going to be maintained. So this is a great property. It makes our code a lot easier to write a lot easier to understand. So go cat's effect. Okay. So now we're going to get into the, I don't know, the meat, the, the real protein of, of this. And so we need a little bit of love. Here's our, here's our complicated, but, but uh, it's a complicated, but full of love state machine for, for you, the audience. Um, so here's the big idea. Uh, we talked about these primitives that cat's effects gives you. So we have the ref and we have the deferred. So we have mutual exclusion for safe updating and um, concurrent signaling with deferred for, serial, for serializing. I'll tell you to do something, but you can't do it until I tell you. So if we have those primitives and we use a bit of brains, this obviously is the hard part. So, you know, BYOB, bring your own brain. If you have these things, you can compose them together into this thing, this concurrent state machine. And so, okay, that's like some fancy words smashed together. We know what a state machine is, and I'm gonna I'm gonna review what it is. But together, we get this safe state machine, which can encapsulate the coordination constraints into a component. So, if we want to ensure that um, changes are done atomically, we want to ensure that events like um, you can't, this, if there's nothing to take in the queue, you want to block your consumers. If the queue is full, you want to block your producers. To enforce these constraints, um, we can jam them, them together the imp in this sort of interface as a component. And the way that component is built and implemented is with this concurrent state machine. So this is the master plan. Okay, so we're gonna go into how to do this um, specifically. So, whee, there we go. Poof, that's what we get. Okay, so 
before we get into concurrent state machines, um, well, you know, a concurrent state machine is just a state machine and you sprinkle some concurrency on it. Ta-da, there you go. So let's just talk about state machines because I haven't talked about it yet. So here's a, a super, here's like the type signature of a state machine. So there's some state that's of type S, you know, this is like the state of the world. So, um, you know, how much money is in my cash register? That's the state of the world. And then you can get some input from the outside world. Like I wanna buy a candy bar. And what your state machine does is it's a function. So it produces a new state. So this would, and it produces some output value. So if, you, if, you, if somebody gives me money, then I'll give them a candy bar. And my state, which is be like the money in my cash machine, you know, I get, there's less, uh, I get, I have more money and less uh, chocolate bars because I gave one away. So that's sort of the basic idea. You can view a state machine is just a function. Um, functional programming, no problem. But we're in Scala, which is an amazing language. So we don't have, not, we not only have functions, but we have objects. So wait a minute, state machines, objects, they're the same thing? Yeah, so like, look at this. So here's a machine. Here's our state machine. It's got some state, you know, I can change it. It's a var, right? I can change vars. And somebody tells me to do something, they give me an input A and I give them a B. And in the implementation of this, uh, I can I could update S if I wanted to. So it, it really is a function from, with this signature, it's the same thing. We just put it in a nice, in a class. That's much easier to read. I don't have like these mixtures of states uh, with the inputs and outputs. Like inputs, outputs are here and the state is hidden. Ah, that's encapsulation. That's object oriented programming. So here's our state machine as a object. Ah, very nice. So if we want a concurrent state machine, what do we do? We sprinkle concurrency on there. And so instead of a var, we a var is not safe. Uh, you know, it, it it loses updates under concurrency. So we can use like a Java atomic reference. So so now we avoid some lost updates. Okay, that's cool. But you know, these are all side effects. We don't want side effects. So instead of side effects with their bugs, we're going to have effects, which are safe. So we're going to change our atomic reference uh, to a cat's effect ref. We know that's safe, composable, lots of good stuff. And that changes the output of our function. And when we take an input of type A, we now produce an effect that has, you know, eventually has a B in it. So F could be like IO. So this is like the, the schema of our concurrent state machine. We're going to have some state that's managed by a, a ref and we're going to have some, what we say, we say effectful, you know, behaviors captured as methods. Um, so here's the recipe. So we're going to build a concurrent state machine. So we, this is sort of the idea of a state machine, um, but we're going to try and, you know, how do we, how do we involve synchronization? We, we have the ref, but what about the deferred when do I do that? When do I use what? Uh, well, how do I do? Anyway, we're, we'll see it. So, um, so here's the here's the recipe. There we go. Uh, it's only um, you know five sub steps and two major steps. So we're all good. So everyone can go home now. You might be at home already, but this is all you do. So so that's a little too complicated. So let me do it with an example. Um, so let's talk about a countdown latch. This is sort of a, you know, quote, standard concurrency um, uh, thing. You know, it mediates between things. So what it does, you know, there's always at least two things trying to coordinate, you know, there, there's concurrent processes. Uh, there's going to, one of the, one of the roles is, is like the waiters, they're waiting for like N things to happen. That's why it's called a countdown lock. So it's waiting for N events, you know, the, the timer or, you know, I'm waiting for five ravens to pass overhead. And when five ravens pass overhead, I can cast my spell, right? So we have to count. Um, so there are people, they're, they're, there's a role of waiters. And then there's somebody who, um, who signals that that event happens. So sort of the invariant, so to speak, would be we need to ensure that end events happen before, happen before. Whenever you see this phrase uh, happen before, 
you know, you can think, ah, I know what that is. Happens before. That's serialization. We want to ensure these events happen before whatever happens next. So this is this is what we're going to work on. Um, so this is how you might use it. So we make a new latch, and it's going to have where n is going to be three. We're waiting for three events. Here, here's my countdown. I'll keep I'll keep my hand in the picture. So we get a latch. And we have our, our different roles. We have the waiters. So all the waiters are doing is says, get me the value, you know, tell me when this thing opens up. And when it does, you know, I'll, I'll print. And the notifiers are the people who say, all right, I'm ready to go. And I'm going to decrement, you know, the latch. And when the latch goes to zero, it's going to wake up the waiters. So I launch three of the notifiers and um, two of the waiters. So the, each notifier is going to do this uh, decrement, which is going to go three, two, one. And then that opens up and notifies the waiters. And so I get the go, go, go of the notifiers and the finally, finally of the two waiters that got their value. This is the order. You know, I, all the goes ha have to happen before the finallys. You know, the finallys only happen after the latch opens. So that's sort of how it works, sort of at the code level. So how would we build one of these? I, I gave like this awesome recipe. So if you just follow the recipe, there's no problems. Um, so let me break it down. So here's the beginning. We're gonna um, define the coordination interface. This is just, you know, defining the interface. Okay, we have a countdown latch, here it is. And there's sort of two parts. We need to. We can't just sort of type, type, type. We have to, we have to, this is the brain part. Uh, and one way to, to think about it is what roles are communicating? I sort of already mentioned it. We have like these waiters and we have the notifiers. The waiters, and we can sort of describe in sort of producty um, terms. Okay, how, how do they behave? Well, waiters block until the latch opens. And the notifiers are the things that, you know, work that notify the latch to decrement in order to open up the latch. Um, so, so that sort of corresponds sort of one method for each of these. So the, the waiters are going to wait, and they'll get an, uh, a, a unit that says, and this will only return this unit when the latch opens. So they get blocked. And the notifiers, they're going to call this decrement metal method, sorry. And that just sort of says, okay, I decremented it. And that's our interface. So that's the place to start. Identify the roles and sort of describe the behavior and, and talk about the external interface. This is the interface that the coordinating, co coordinating components are going to you know, be mediated through. OK, so we did that. So next, we got to think about the state, the internal state. You don't see it from the outside. But on the inside of the countdown latch, we need something to say, OK, is the latch open or not? Um, how many notifications am I waiting for? And we model the state you know, as an algebraic data type. So I'm still in, my, I'm mentally in Scala 2, so I did in Scala 2. Um, so there's really two choices. Either the, the latch is uh, open, you know, we've, we've reached 0, so there's, there's no state there. Um, but if, if we're waiting for n, you know, here's our n. That's how many things I'm waiting for. It's sort of n outstanding, one might say. And then in order to um, implement the behavior of the waiters, I want to block the waiters. I want to ensure that the waiters, whatever the waiters are going to do next, happens after the latch opens. So when you think, when you hear those happens after or happens before, I want to ensure the latch opens before the waiters get no before the waiters do something. Whenever you hear that, you say, ah, I need a deferred. Deferred represents that serialization. So I'm going to need something that the, the waiters are going to wait on. Uh, so here's my deferred that holds that state. So when it gets anyway, zero, we're going to complete that deferred. So then so we have our, uh, just to back up, we have our interface that's our countdown latch. We have our internal state. Uh, now we need to manage that state. So 
when we construct, here's a factory method, we're going to construct a countdown latch. Uh, we need to manage that state inside of a ref because currently there's going to be decrement, 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 decrement. And maybe they're all trying to modify that state. You know, they're all trying to, you don't want to lose any of the updates that are decrementing this N. So we need ref to make sure that there's mutual exclusion. So we make our deferred because we need to put it into our state. And here's our initial state. And then we return a new thing that we don't know how to do yet. So we've defined the state that's going to be internal. And we manage it with a ref. And then finally, we just implement the interface. So uh, and we think back to our roles and our behaviors. So this um, and these are this is our this is really our state machine. So for the waiters, uh, they're waiting for the latch to open. So when somebody calls a wait, we say, OK, well, let's get the current state. And there's two choices. Either the current state is outstanding with some value of n that we don't really care about. Or we're done. Now, if we're done, we can just return. We do not, we when when the latch is open, we don't want to block anybody. We just want to say, you do whatever you need to do. But if the, the latch isn't open, it has this deferred in here. And so we call the get method, which blocks the caller. So this is imp implementing the, the wait. So pretty straightforward. We do, we we are acting on the current state. We're not modifying it. We can we only ask what it is currently. And then we, you know, we do a case analysis and uh, provide handle each case. Similarly, for the decrement, this one actually we need to modify it, right? We're we're notifying the latch that an event happened, so we need to decrement the counter. And again, if we're done, there's nothing to do. So the interesting case is uh, either we reached the it was the count of one, so that means we're going to go to zero next. So if there's only one left, if this is the last decrement, the last notification, we set our new state to done, and we complete the deferred with that unit value. We say, OK, now everybody who's waiting, you can go. Uh, otherwise, we go from we do our decrement, n to n minus 1. Easy peasy. And so kind of the key is, um, for each of these methods, we have a straight a state transition that deals with the ref. So we're, we're doing something with the ref that we have. And if we need to block anywhere, we always we always do something with the deferred. We unblock it or block it. And so we did it. We made a countdown latch. We have this interface. There's readers and writers. Uh, you know, there's waiters and notifiers. And it all fits together. And it wasn't too bad. Please, I hope it wasn't too bad. OK, so that was the example. And that's really, that's really it. So uh, we made it. So let me, let me kind of review what we did and sort of why it's important. So, so we did one example. We did this countdown latch thing. Um, but if we back up a sec, we first started, we said, OK, well, there's there's these components, they're running, they're, they're executing on separate logical threads, it's fibers, whatever you want to call it. Uh, if they need to synchronize, they, we want to ensure and maintain some sort of invariance on the ordering. Things happening not at the same time, things happening before or after. This is the, these are the invariants we want to enforce. You know, don't talk to the database. Uh, don't open up the HTTP port until the database is ready. You know, these sorts of things. And so we can encapsulate these constraints into like components, you know, mediators that sort of mediate between the coordinating components. And these are the things that enforce those constraints. And we can build those coordinating things using this idea of a concurrent state machine. And it's really powerful and um, nice because it's composed of these standard primitives. We use deferred and we use ref. And together with our brains uh, and lots of tests, 
we can compose them together into very complex behaviors. We can make um, latches, we can make cues, we can make um, cyclic barriers, we can make circuit breakers, we can make all sorts of things. Uh, and the implementations of those are pretty, are, are fairly straightforward in the sense that, you know, we basically pattern match on the state and, you know, sort of decompose the problem into different cases that are depending on the state. So it's a state machine. If I'm in this state, do this. Otherwise, do this other thing. And that makes the implementation and, the, and understanding this code a lot simpler. And so now, sort of with this, with sort of this uh, recipe, you, you could really now go into all the, you know, the Cat's Effect library itself, uh, the whole Davinverse, if you, know, if you know that. So like there's all these libraries out there that use this idea because it's very powerful. And this is how you do it. And based on Cat's Effect, you get all these advantages. There's a big lever that allows you to get these large behaviors that coordinate lots of things going on at the same time. So it's a very cool. Now, now I'm, my hope is that you, you have like the conceptual vocabulary and sort of the practical um, vocabulary and recipe to sort of understand the structure of these things and how they work. And you can build on them too. So that's all I have. We have concurrent state machines, super powerful, allows you to make complex, express complex constraints and ideas. Uh, you can learn more about Cat's Effect at the Cat's Effect uh, site at type level. The Little Book of Semaphores is a great uh, little uh, resource for sort of understanding concurrency at, at a very basic and powerful level. Uh, thanks to the Happy Automata State Machine for letting me steal some of those pictures to ease my own fears about state machines. Fabio, thank you. And uh, if you want to learn more, I, I talk about this in my book. Uh, if you want to sort of back up a little bit and learn about cat's effect, what are effects, uh, and eventually um, how to use the concurrency features of cat's effect, you can check my book out. Uh, talk to me, I'll give you a discount. And then uh, sort of stepping back, thanks for having me at ScalaCon. Uh, Noel and I are inner products. We can help you. We can help your team. We can help your projects. We can help your code. And uh, thank you very much. Happy to answer questions. Well, Adam, thank you so much for your talk. And we will move into our Q&A section here. I think we have at least one question for you. All, all right. right, here we go. Do you think all of this can be done with the Scala standard library? For example, <coughs> with futures and promises, what disadvantages could it have? Ah, yeah, I mean, so uh, it's not, I don't want to devolve into the, like, everything's a Turing machine. Um, so of course you can do it. But um, there are different ways to, to attack this problem. There are lots of libraries that use futures and promises. You know, Akka and that ecosystem uses futures and promises. Um, the approach of Cat's Effect and other li similar libraries is really to sort of crank up the safety. Um, uh, at least that's the way I think, I think about it, in the sense of like making sure that what we're declaring we want to do is separate from the execution of what we want to do. So um, sort of the big gotcha in the world of futures is if you declare a future, it's going to start executing. It's going to get scheduled. We want to separate that. So what's nice about Cat's Effect IO and others is we can declare what we want to do and we can compose them safely sort of in a referentially transparent way, in a safe way, and we get these larger effects um, that we can understand. Uh, and then only, only at the very end, we say go. Um, this has sort of a lot of well-known um, advantages. That's sort of what the question's about. Uh, I'm happy to explain more. There's a lot of blog posts about it. You can read about it on uh, Type Level Cat's Effect. You can read about it um, at my book site. Um, so yes, it can, totally can do it. But I would say that if you talk to folks who use Cat's Effect, they are way more relaxed programmers because they're like, okay, I know what's going to happen. Um, there's just less ambiguity. And, um, and that lets us use our limited brain power uh, to tackle bigger things. 
Awesome. Great <laughs> answer. All right. Next question. Can we go over the recipe for concurrent state machines again, real quick? <laughs> sure. Um, well, it's a big slide. Uh, I can post it somewhere. <laughs> um, but so it is complicated in the sense of like, I was really struggling. I was writing my slides, you know, and because I had like four different ways of trying to describe it. I had like a table and then like a checklist. And um, so one way to think about it is um, there's sort of the external interface. This is sort of the, the interface that the communicating components are going to use. So you don't have to think about the state machine at all. It's just like, I want to, I want to wait for an event to happen and somebody else is going to say the event happened. Those are separate things. So there's like publishers, you know, publishers and subscribers or producers and consumers or things that want to grab the lock. You think about that and you think about just the interface that you want to give those things that are communicating. So that's the first step. Um, so it's a, lot, it's a very sort of role-based um, behavioral analysis. Um, and then, and then you figure out, okay, well, is the behavior of those methods, are they going to, is it, wh how does it vary? So, in it, and what you want to do is you want that behavior to vary depending on some state. So, like in our example of the latch, it was this number and it was getting, every time somebody notified a, of a decrement, it would get smaller and smaller. And only when it hit zero would it wake everybody up. So, if you're waiting and you say, and, and the latch isn't open, you just get you get stuck, um, and if you decrement, you'll just keep lowering the number, and the the magic happens when it hits zero. And so, anytime you think, anytime you have sort of this, um, so you use a ref to manage the state. You know, you do the modify of the ref when you want to change the state. And anytime you want to say, I need to block somebody, or you know, another way of saying blocking would be, I don't want somebody to continue until I say so then you use a deferred. And those are sort of the, the basic things that you glue together. Um, and what's nice about the, the ref is you can say, okay, I wanna do something and it, you, it'll give you the current state and you can say, okay, well, if it's in this state, I wanna go to this new state and, and, and perform this action. Or if it was in this other state, I wanna go to this other state and do this other action. So that's, that's the basics of the recipe and I hope that was clear. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much for going over that again. All right. Next question. Can you tell us about how concurrency is managed in other languages and how this compares to the example of Scala and Katz effect? Um, well, there's different models of concurrency. So there's like the actor model where, you know, it's, it's all about, and by model, it's sort of, you could think about it as there's like the mathematical model, blah, blah, blah. But um, the way I tend to think about it is like, what, what does the user need to know in order to use this system? So like, um, in cat's effect, if you have a value of, t of type IO, it's, it's like this black box and it's an IO of a, so you know that you, you, you'll ask for, you say, whoever's running it is going to give you an A, but it's not, you don't know when it's going to appear. It's sort of when is not a concern. You know, it might be some super complicated transaction and you won't get it for 10 years or maybe it's already there. Um, or, um, but then there's ways of sort of declaring, um, declaring the concurrency. So like in Cat's Effect, you say there's like map n versus par map n. And when you have the par map n, that means run these um, effects concurrently, which says, I don't care how they, there's no, I'm declaring sort of statically, there's no coordination between them, at least at the level that you can see. Maybe maybe underneath you can. Um, in other systems like the actor model that Akka uses, you know, the programmer, what they're exposed to is like, they don't have to worry about threads. They, they can sort of assume that there's always mutual exclusion on the state. So you can use a var. The sort of the, the case of the lost update in with a var it is ruled out in the in like the actor model, but you have to kind of trust that that the, that that thing is protecting you. Whereas it's a bit more, I don't know. There's a trade off between the creating these special semantics. You know, oh, it's a var, but you really don't have to worry about it. Versus an IO 
says well, this is what you can do about it, um, and the semantics are hidden. But also, there's the clear the implementation is hidden. Um, so there's different ways that they exposed it. Um, there's threads, you know, threads and locks are sort of the classic case that locks don't compose. So, you know, I have the lock and I'm I'm waiting for this lock, but somebody else wants, you know, but I'm holding a lock that somebody else has, and and now you get stuck, and you know, you put there's somebody pushing on the door, and everyone's pushing on the door, and nobody can open the door. Um, you know, you can still get into deadlock scenarios with things like cat's effect, um, but I would say that the interfaces and behaviors are a bit more well defined than just a low level JVM lock, for example. And there's lots of folks online. This is a great, that's a great question for the folks on the Cats Effect channel on Discord that I'm sure Daniel or, or Fabio would have a uh, many paragraph answer. <laughs> well, that was a pretty good answer. So thank you for taking the time to do that. Uh, we have another question. How dependable is the cancellation logic for Cats Effect ah, IO? Yes. Let's say it needs to be interrupted for something really important. Right. This is a caveat I forgot to add to my slide. So there's a one aspect of this I did not cover, which is cancellation, which is extremely important. Um, so if you if you have an effect um, in in the world of Cat's Effect IO, there's basically three states it can be in. You know, once it once it runs, it can be successful. You know, it completed it through an exception and there was an error, or it could be canceled. So it didn't finish. That's different than it produced a result or it threw an exception. Um, so Cat's Effect has a cancellation model, um, and folks can can read up on that or ask about that. Um, so you can basically there's automatic ways it can be interrupted. So uh, for example, if the the most common way is like if you if you use that par map n construct, uh, you're saying run this batch of stuff in parallel, and I don't care. Um, if any one of them fails, par map n is going to cancel all the rest because the only way the par map n succeeds is if they all succeed. So if any of them fail, it just if one of them fails, it cancels the rest of them. So it says, "Hey, stop what you're doing." Um, there's aspects of automatic cancellation, so it'll cancel sort of automatically. And there's ways to sort of um, ask the universe if you're if you're writing an effect, "Am I canceled?" Um, so it's it's definitely a big topic, um, but it is really important, and it's definitely possible to. Uh, you can get the really important signal. Don't worry, you can get it. Awesome. And I think we have time for one more question here. So we'll do one last question. And that is, would you mind saying a few words about the history of Cat's Effect? What did Scala oh. devs use before Cat's Effect? What inspired Cat's Effect? Was it something in Haskell? Where does the idea originate? Ah. Um, I think other folks are probably more qualified, but... Um, <laughs> I mean, the, I, the ideas, as I understand it, that they were the, it sort of started off um, from functional programming in Scala, which, which talked about how to make something like I.O. That, that sort of was um, concurrent with um, the library Scala Z or Scala Z. There were implementations. And I mean, it's definitely informed by other languages, other runtimes. It's sort of... Um, I'm, I'm sure there's things in Haskell. You know, Haskell is sort of I/O by default, so there's, it, it, it has advantages, but it doesn't have necessarily the problems that that uh, something on the JVM has. Um, so it's definitely a rich history. It's lots of stealing, and I would also say lots of innovation. So um, you know, there's 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 good evidence that you know Cat's effect is super fast, super efficient, super smart. And, um, you know, it's even, even better than, you know, like what the newest JVMs are doing with sort of the project loom and all that stuff. I don't know too much about that, but, you know, it's sort of, do you, do you try and optimize the world of threads and, 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 um, fibers and all this stuff at the JVM level, or can you do it at the, at a higher level, like in Scala and not even have to worry about that? Do I, do I need to modify the JVM? And sort of the answer that Cat's effect says is, you don't need to modify the JVM. The JVM is awesome. Look what we can do. Um, but I encourage folks, folks to ask more. And, and I know there are some other histories around. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Adam. Thank you for taking the time to answer some questions today. Thank you for your presentation. And thank you again for joining us here at ScalaCon. Thanks. Great to be here. Yeah.